UFOs part four, fifth segment with Marty Garza, Brothers of the Serpent podcast. 30% brain expansion. 33. 33% brain expansion. Oh, we, we raising it up a little bit here? Yeah. <laughs> I just had to, yeah, I just realized like. Of course it's 33%. Yeah, it's yeah. got to be 33 yeah, okay. But also, <laughs> what I was saying before was like, oh, yeah, it's, it's it seems more likely to me that there are these, you know, sacred sites in the world rather than this being some kind of uh, government tech type yeah. stuff. But, of course, if that were true, then it would behoove governments of the world to study that technology or, yeah. or study that phenomenon yeah. or those phenomena and uh, figure out how to utilize them, right? So it could be both. Yeah. And then there's the my labs, you know, where it does seem like some government is getting involved. I don't know how much you – have you followed those, you know, the military-style abductions? Yeah, I mean – Like that could are, also be a screen memory. I don't know. There are clearly – I mean, unquestionably, psychological operations. Mm -hmm. um, that, I mean, that's pretty well established. I mean, we know yeah. that, that the government has done, you know, CIA has done, you know, very Terrible nasty stuff. things yeah. to people. And, yeah. But I don't know that that's something that could be considered a global, you know, reach type operation. No, I don't and think so either, yeah. It's been going on for too long. And, you know, as we're seeing in this... And I know this seems like it's a departure for it, but it will it, you'll start to see the parallels here and how that maybe these same phenomenon have been described throughout recorded history in different ways. Yeah, of course. They, and where they were being perceived as different things mm -hmm. than what we what we might now call an extraterrestrial or ultra terrestrial. Yeah. Like the extraterrestrial is just the current cultural veneer over the same phenomena that's been happening for thousands of years. Correct. Yeah. Okay. And as, as far as governments go, as a whole, for a government, it would be unwise to use, like, the the rule of never mark anything as unknown. Just yeah. <laughs> say it's this or that. Sounds like a bad idea to me. Like, that would be a really <laughs> bad idea unless that's just the, what you wanted to portray. Yeah. Because, of course, you're trying to do stuff undercover. Yeah. Um, so, or you yeah. figured out just enough to realize how terrifying the reality actually is or something like that. That's the other thing I think of is like, do they know just enough to make it scary? And so then they want to bury everything and they don't want to release all this information. And then they tell you, oh, it's national security or we can't give you, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, ways or the methods, you know, that we got this, like even releasing the information lets gives you enough information yeah. to know about what of our what our sensors are like and these are all top secret and yeah, they yeah, tell yeah. you all this bullshit, but it's just like, okay, well, what about the stuff you looked at in the forties? You know, that can't possibly be top secret anymore in terms of instrumentation. Right. I was listening to a I don't even remember which podcast it was, I was listening to one and they uh they asked a question, what's your favorite um conspiracy theory? And it got me thinking, what's, you know, what's my favorite country? And I, I thought, I thought to myself, you know, I believe possibly the craziest conspiracy theory is that the government has, has um, conspired to lead us to believe that they're withholding information that they don't actually have. Yeah, that's a good one too. That they don't, they, I mean, clearly they know more than the public knows. <clears throat> They have more data. Right. They have more data, but that doesn't mean they understand it. Of course not. They could be receiving information that's conflicting and they could be as perplexed about this as we are. In fact, that's what... That's what it seems like. That's what it seems... At least in regard to Skinwalker. It, it seems yeah. as though they don't have any real idea what's going on there either. Yeah. So let's move on. on. Let's, keep, let's keep going with this, this theme and see if we can circle back and have this make some sense. Mobius strip back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, Hope McDonald compiled a book titled When Angels Appear, in which she recounts anecdotes of angelic visitations gathered from among friends and acquaintances. The stories are not especially memorable. Many of them, she, as she calls angel stories, could be called something else. Some of them are dubious. For example, she cites classic pieces of modern folklore, uh, folklore known as the Vanishing Hitchhiker encounters 
as angelic encounters. But they do draw attention to the large number of people who have experienced something that they think is miraculous. Miss McDonald found that most of her informants had three things in common. They had never told their stories before. The experience had made a great impact on their lives. And they were grateful for the opportunity to describe it. John Keel tells, similar react, tells of similar reactions when questioning large bodies of silent contactees whose UFO experiences had never been publicized. However, it is more unusual for one's angel to remain unseen and merely to warn... It's more usual for one's angel to remain unseen and merely to warn or arrest one in the course of action with a single word or sentence or silently with a touch on the shoulder. Even less tangible are the sudden hunches and intuitions also like the work of a guardian angel, which appear out of the blue to make us miss a plane that's doomed to crash or simply search for an unlikely place for a, lo for a lost object. As Miss McDonald remarks, People, by and large, have little desire to speak about their demonic experiences, let alone prove them to others. They know instinctively that they belong in a separate, fragile reality that must be cherished in silence rather than blabbed about. And this is the one reason we hear so little about them. Yeah, so some of that you were just talking about, like the Vanishing Hit Tracker. Of course, I've seen tons of those stories and heard them. And then the tap on the shoulder, the voice in the ear... Third man effect, you know, uh, and then the other thing is that, like, the, the whole thing about, there's this fascinated me for a while. There's this, and this is, to, as far as I know, this has been statistically shown that planes that crash, that end up crashing or, or something, for whatever reason, they have the highest cancellation rate of people just deciding not to go on that flight, you know. Like it's like, and it doesn't. It's not. You can't look at individual ones, but just over over a bunch of them, planes that have gone down or had some kind of problem. More people cancel seats on those flights than other <laughs> ones. It's weird. It's like you know. It's statistically. It statistically shows that somehow people get a feeling they're like, I don't. I'm not going on this one. That's yeah. yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Guardian angels derive from Neoplatonism and along, the, along with other classes of angels became a part of the Christian dogma at the Council of Nicaea. But long before this, the ancient Greeks believed that individuals were attached at birth to a daimon who determined wholly or in part their destiny. Plato's mentor, Socrates, had a daimon who was famous for always saying no. It did not enter into rational discourse with Socrates. It merely warned him when he was about to do something wrong, especially if it was something displeasing to the gods. <laughs> like the prompting of a conscience, and indeed like a cryptic guardian angel, cited Miss McDonald. Plato in, in the Timaeus identified an individual daimon with the element of pure reason and man, uh, what? In man, and it, so it became just a lofty spirit guide or Freudian, Freudian super eagle. This may be true of certain, perhaps exceptional individuals, but it is also true that diamonds are likely to be, uh, represent unreason as a, or at least be equivocal. But meanwhile, it is instructive to consider the case of Napoleon, who had a similar spirit which protected him, which guided him as a diamond, and which in at particular moments, took the shape of a shining sphere, which he called his star, or which visited him in the figure of a dwarf clothed in red to warn him. This reminds us that personal diamonds favor two forms, which, which manifest as an abstract light globe or oval, as in a shining sphere, or the personification of angelic, mannequin-like, or whatever, it confirms, in other words, that two forms are different manifestations of each other. With Napoleon's different, with Napoleon's case, different functions. The star guides the dwarf warns. Both are images of the soul, which, another in another way, which is another way of understanding the diamond. Yeah, wouldn't that be similar to like a higher self thing in modern 
terms, right? Everybody's born with one, and it kind of guides you throughout your life or something. Um, the book covers – I mean, it's a, like a 450-page book, and it, it covers um, y- uh, Jung a lot. Okay. He, he had a diamond. As yeah. well, which is strange. In other words, it's it's strange that these familiar personalities had this guide yeah. that they you know they o- spoke openly about. Yet yeah, the idea these ideas today seem rather strange. In other words, mm. it sounds fantastical. Or, so, um, we would like to believe that all diamonds are at least potentially helpful and protective, but this isn't the case. There are diamonds which, frankly, it is difficult to attach rhyme or reason. Far from being articulate, wise, or superhuman, they appear to be brutal or subhuman. We would like to think that they have nothing to do with us, but that is we can't be sure. Nevertheless, they do seem to be impersonal and as in those diamonds at the top of the uh, spiritual spectrum. They only seem especially alien or frightening to us because we cannot, by definition, make a personal connection with them. Wait, why, why by definition, can we not make a personal connection? Because they are... Like way above us in the spiritual realm or something? Is that the implication? He suggests that they are always operating in the background. Okay. That... Things like intuition or the voice. In we your can't head possibly or, understand always, their motives. Right. And and they're contradictory. In other words, sometimes some are positive, some are negative. They're tricksters. They're, correct. Okay. Note the parallels to the different topics we've covered in mm-hmm. the past three sections or, yeah. or uh podcasts. There there are a lot of parallels to the way um alien encounters have been described you know yeah. sometimes they're deceitful you yep. know they show a lot of the same traits that are being attributed to the mm. Um this is an interesting story in an interview with Greg Carlwood author Harper gave a notable example of a diamond interaction with an individual named Jack Prieger a 35 year old farmer in Wales one day in 1965, while spreading manure in his fields, Prager suddenly hears a voice in his head telling him, quote, become a doctor. Never having had any interest in medicine, he thought to himself, I must be losing my mind. So he decides to test the voice and asks, who says so? The voice responds, I say so. So he plays along and says, and who are you? The voice replies, I am the paraclete. He goes home later that evening wondering what had happened and what the hell is a paraclete. He picked up a dictionary and looks up the word and finds a short three-word definition. The Holy Spirit. Hmm. Despite his age and reservations, he enrolled at the Royal College of Surgeons in Dublin, Ireland, where he received his medical degree at the age of 42. Although he had no license to practice legally in India, he moved to Calcutta and began treating the sick and injured where they lay under bridges, on railway platforms, and in drainage pipes. He went on to open a roadside clinic where he provided free medical treatment to the hordes of destitute. Hounded and harassed by local authorities for his illegal status, Prager was even even threatened by mafia groups and at one point thrown in jail. His case dragged on for years while his clinic carried on the vital work and on occasion treating up to 500 patients per day. Prieger operated under these conditions for 14 years until he finally was successful in registering the Calcutta Rescue as an official medical facility. In 2019, at the age of 88 and in declining health, Prager finally retired and returned to the UK after 40 years of service to the poor. Wow. But the work of the Calcutta Rescue continues to this day in his absence. <laughs> wow, that's crazy. Just he's like out there hoeing the <laughs> hoeing the weeds, and some voice hoeing is like the manure. Become a doctor, right? Who said that? <laughs> the Paraclete. <laughs> Somebody call me. <laughs> yep. 
In polythe polytheistic religions, many gods are, are mediated by a multitude of diamonds who are often perceived as being virtual gods or at least godlings themselves. Um, godlings. This, yeah. This, the seamless continuity between gods and diamonds is the source of endless confusion for the classifying mind. Mon monotheistic religions are impatient of diamonds. Christianity's chief method of getting rid of the diamonds was to demonize them. This process began with the earliest, with the earliest of the New Testament writings, the epistles of Saint Paul, the things called the Gentile, the things which the Gentiles sacrifice. Said Paul, reproachably, they sacrifice to the devil and are not to God and not to God. The Greek word he used for devils was diamana or diamonds. At a stroke, the host of intermediate beings recognized by all pagans, peoples everywhere were stigmatized as demons in the service of Satan. At best, a, the complex diamond realm, such as the one re, uh, revered by Greco-Roman poly, uh, polytheism, was subsided under the uh, Christian angelic realm. And all the old diamonds were, of course, classified as demonic angels who had been cast out of heaven along with Satan. But I mean, it's it. It sounds a lot like the guardian angel too. So it's like they created a different name for it, for that part of the phenomena. If you remember, so it's almost like I, mean, I don't know. That seems too. I, I would say that they were trying to say there are some good and some bad, right? It's it's the it's the. You know, you got the demon on your shoulder and the angel on the other side, and they're arguing with each other and trying to tell you. <laughs> If you remember back to uh, UFOs Part One and uh, and the, the uh, witness of another world story, um, there was the shaman mm -hmm. that was describing the entity that was encountered, and they said that there were both good ones and bad ones, mm -hmm. and that they were imperceivable between the that you had to be very careful in dealing with You'd them because you didn't know if you were yeah. being deceived. Right. Uh, again, it's, it's sort so of like what I'm a consistent... trying to say. Yeah, what I'm trying to say is that uh, Christianity just kind of rebranded that. That's exactly whole thing. what he's it trying wasn't, to say. Yeah, but as these could be both physical and non-physical, they were demonized. They were they lumped them all as being bad. Hmm. Says the Christian ideal of angels derived from the diamonds of neighboring competing doctrines such as Gnosticism and Neoplatonism, which were condemned as heretical. At first, when Christianity imagined its angels as having bodies of air and light, its demons were su supposed to be similarly ethereal bodies, which, according to St. Augustine, gave them extraordinary powers of perception and enabled them to move through the air at extraordinary speeds. However, over centuries, they shed their bodies and became purely sp spiritual. The man most responsible for the spiritualizing process was was uh, the anonymous 5th century mystic known as Dionysus of Ap Apagite. Apagite. He was thoroughly now, uh, Neoplatonic. His, in his, work, uh, his work reflected it. And even quotes Pericles, who was teaching in Athens around AD 430. He was also a Christian. Thus, when when in the 6th century, the Neoplatonic uh, school at Athens closed down and the one at Alexandria passed to the Christian hands, Dionysus' influence in, uh, ensured that the diamonds were assimilated into Christianity, not in their original form as partially physical and partially spiritual, but as purely spiritual. Hmm. As early as the 5th century, St. Jerome initiated uh, in, intimated that the demons could take on grotesque forms and be seen and heard by and felt by human beings. By the time of the Middle Ages, demons were thought to be capable of, peer, of appearing physically on earth. In the 13th century, Caesarus of uh, he Heisterbach was telling stories of demons in the guise of big, ugly men dressed in black, and when they were 
when they were wanting to seduce a woman, fine and smartly dressed fellows. Even horses, dogs, and cats, and bears, and other animals. Around 1270, it was thought advisable to compose and, uh, and dis, uh, dis, uh, dis, what? Discours, Abbot of Chantal, into a book uh, for the purposes of warning novice monks about the dangerous, highly organized hierarchy of demons. The first and most cunning of demons arrived and dwelled in, dwelled in the air and issued instructions to demons that were of a cruder sort who patrolled the earth. So they're setting up a hierarchy. <clears throat> Sounds very Sitchin esque. Right. Yeah. Right. So the point being that they are make that he's making parallels between the UFO experience or entity experiences that we see today. To in other words, I'm not suggesting necessarily that this is truly religious in nature. I'm pointing out how these are things that were being discussed thousands of years ago. Yeah. They were just in being interpreted in in a religious yeah, yeah, way. Yeah. yeah. But they're really no different than the you know the apparitions and things that are being described as happening at Skinwalker and you know yeah. there's something going on that we may not fully perceive. Yeah, we're interpreting them in a religious way. Like when they were discussing this, may, they may have not been talking about religion necessarily. You know what I mean? Oh, you the, mean we're interpreting what they were saying in a religious yes. way? Yes. Like, yeah. In other words, like that's kind of the way our historians and scholars have cast that type of those types of ideas. Whereas they may not, you know, they've been like, hey, check it out. You know, when you see the um, the orbs and stuff flying around, bad. Stay away. <laughs> <laughs> the good guys aren't going to do that anymore. In his book, The Discarded Image, C.S. Lewis tries to depict the universe as it was seen through the eyes of a medieval person. He described their view of the heavens and the precise system of crystalline spheres towering like great cathedrals, vast and finite, into space. And he is just about to describe their view of Earth and its inhabitants who occupy the lower end of the great chain of being, which stretches down from God to the angels and man and animals and vegetables and every stone, when he finds himself obliged to pause and consider an anomalous class of beings. They are not only strange to him as a literary historian, and, and they, but they are also at odds with cosmology. Oh, in a world even more precise or orderly than our own worldview. Following the, uh, the Roman writer Mar Marchanus Capella, he calls these beings longavis, longavis, hmm. long-lived ones. Yeah. Wow. Of which haunt Long woods, head. glades, and groves, and lakes, and springs, and brooks, whose names are pans, fawns, styres, sylvans, nymphs. They are, of course, our diamonds. In a sense, he says Lewis, their unimportance is their importance. They are marginal, figurative creatures. They are perhaps the only creatures to whom the model we don't does not assign an official status, and it is this, and it is true of our own model of the cosmos. It is in nature. It is the nature of the diamonds to always be unofficial, creating a stumbling block block to the orderly structures by which we envision creation. What, so these things may be the, because I know there was this, <clears throat> there's this, the idea of the, the order in chaos, you know, and the, the simplest diagram is the circles. One, is, one circle is order, one circle is chaos, and they overlap a little bit. And, in that, and then that vesica where they overlap is the entire universe. Because you can't have too much order, because then nothing will change. And you can't have too much chaos, because then... Really Nothing can apart. be there, you know. It can't. It is just constant change. So you need both. And he's saying that these things are insertions of the chaotic element into the orderly world. That's the implication he's giving. That they don't have a status because they're too chaotic. They're all of these, all of these beings, these things that inhabit the peripherals of everything, and they kind of get in your life and they screw something up, and then, and they, you know, and thereby whether they're doing it, whether they are viewed being as good or bad. 
the trickster element is the insertion of chaos into the order of the universe. I think it it's also possible that they're that they are also struggling to try to come to terms with something they don't understand. Well, that there's I, something going on. Um, I can that empathize, they, emphasize right, with that. <laughs> right. They, they sense that there is an influence that's not t- necessarily tangible, but they do recognize that it does seem to have an influence some in some way. Yeah. On in in our world. But it was just it was just interesting because the way he was saying, you know, these are the nymphs and the and the gnomes and all the other creatures. He, and then he said these are they live at the margins. They're in the periphery. They're kind of at the edges of vision all the time. But they're there. But they also don't have a status. Like they're not gods. They're not demigods. They're they're not quite spirits. They're not quite fully physical. They're not totally real. But they're not completely unreal, right? So he's he's giving this. They're they're in this in between state, and yet they seem to have an influence. Right. And yeah. You so can't, they're also neither good nor bad. They're both they're actually just like everything else. They're both of those things. Are they real or not? They're both. Are they physical or non physical? Both of those. Are they good or bad? They're both of those. So <laughs> it's chaos. I I was trying to think again of an analogy to use to explain the phenomena in general, all of it. This, uh, you know, what we're talking about right here as well as all the other aspects of it. And I, I said, I thought to myself, um, um, in in the pyramid game, you know, like the $100,000 pyramid, $10,000 pyramid. In the pyramid game, a teammate is given vague clues to a specific meaning. Likewise, in the game Pictionary, a teammate creates rough sketches to also convey specific meanings. In both games, the ability for the contestant to identify the correct answer is dependent on their teammate's ability to adequately convey a synonym or semaphore. Anyone who has played these games knows all too well how frustrating such a prospect can be, even for common everyday objects and terms. Now imagine playing these games attempting to convey to your teammate an abstraction. And to further complicate this objective, you must do so without references to 19th through 21st century technology or developments. How successful do you believe you could be in conveying or interpreting such clues? Yeah. Documentary producer James Fox recently commented about UFO footage shown to him by Chuck Clark, which he suggested, which he struggled to convey um, the experience even as an objective third party observer. If, with our ever-increasing familiarity with all the modern technologies, we still don't possess an adequate vocabulary to describe such an encounter, just imagine the difficulty in describing this type of an anomalous experience hundreds or thousands of years ago. Yeah. Now throw into that, throw into that um, innate our innate perceptual limitations. And also consider the possibility that the phenomenon being observed may be purposely altering our perception. As depicted in the movie Contact, does the phenomenon actively reach into one's mind and assume a facade that is understandable or purposely confusing to the individual? Yeah. Or is the appearance simply a passive construct of our interpretation based on potentially inadequate sensors? Yeah, like in Contact... When she finally makes it to the contact place, it's her father, right? Isn't that what it was? Right. Yeah. And she says, you know, she's like, Dad. And he's like, no, I'm just appearing to you like this because it's something In you an understand. understandable form. Yeah. Yeah. No, and mean, that's giving almost, quote unquote, you know, godlike powers to this extraterrestrial intelligence in contact is the idea. You know, they 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 use SETI to send us data to build a machine that basically sends her through... Uh, an overlapping time cave hole to speak to her dad, which is actually the embodiment of the intelligence of this, whatever it is, the star child, the alien. The problem is though, there seems to be a pattern with like, when you think about it on a, like a technological standpoint, things coming out of the ocean, uh, saucer shapes, bright lights, fast movements through the air, things that we interpret today as highly technologically advanced machines are the same things that 
people that had no way of like imagining that type of technology it happened to them so it's like if it was if it was purely something that was going to be altering your perception to give you something that was a some cultural false, meme yeah then yeah. why is that consistent over <laughs> thousands of years right why are there these paintings with these saucer like things with little beams coming down in them <laughs> you know it seems like they've got some consistency yeah well if you notice like on these in these uh old reports they they refer to them very often refer to them as meteors or comets but they don't yeah. act as meteors they, right. they maneuver well yeah and, but that and that's that's to the point is that is that they had no frame of reference or they the frame of reference that they had you know they used the best thing that they had which was a comet or a meteor i mean there there are old reports of actual ships you know like like sailing boats in the sky. Yeah, because that was their frame of reference. Right, and like it was a ship, and then they, it would drop an anchor, and it would get caught on something, you know? I mean, and then they would see people coming down the chain. To, like, there are accounts like this where you're just like, what? what? Well, you know, <laughs> earlier we talked about, <laughs> what? The, you know, the fish people. Yeah. You know, and they're, you know, Ea, and they're, they're you know, and they're wearing a fish on, like, the yeah. like, fish head on <laughs> yeah. scales. And, like, no, that, no, no, man. These are my pants. <laughs> I, look at, I, I look at that potentially as being along the same lines as the depictions of angels. So, like, people say, well, you know, why, why does, where did the idea of an angel with wings come from? And they're like, well, imagine you're a painter and you're trying to convey, uh, you know, an image of a person floating and, it, and it's like, well, is this guy just a bad painter? Why is this person way look up like in they're the in air. the air? Right. <laughs> well, the only way they could convey the fact that these this entity was flying or floating was they put wings on it. Well, yeah, yeah, exactly. maybe the fact that these entities or individuals came from the ocean, the only way they could express that was to put a fish on them. Like, yeah. Oh, they're a fish. They mm -hmm. came from the water. Yeah, they came out of the ocean. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, and, and just, or the wings are a symbol to say they are of the sky. Correct. Right? They're not literal. Yeah, exactly. and the fish is a symbol to say they are of the water. Correct. Yeah, yeah. And the shoulder rivers? I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> what, what are shoulder rivers? <laughs> exactly. This guy makes the water <laughs> with the fish in it. <laughs> you know, and we, and we talk about this co-creation, you know, idea. So... For example, does the clothing sometimes described as being worn by the entities give us a clue that it's potentially co-creation? I mean, what is the likelihood that entities from elsewhere would be wearing garments we're familiar with? Yeah. Yeah. However, if it is co-creation, how can multiple witnesses independently and simultaneously observe and corroborate observations of the phenomenon from different vantage points? Right. And I mean, a lot of times their garments are described as very generic. You know, it was a jumpsuit, one piece, right. and it's a single color. It was gray or it was blue, you know. Sometimes they'll describe it as a symbol on it, but a lot of times, like, Fra uh, not Fravor, um, what was the guy's name? I was just talking about him. He described that he had, what he thought it was a like a uniform, but he said it had no insignia. Travis Walton? Travis Walton, yeah. He was like, it was like, and, and this was the human that shows up after he freaks out when the entities are in there the alien gray things he wakes up and they're all all those grays are around him and he freaks out and he run he picks up grabs something and he starts swinging it at him and then he runs out of the room they know. run out of the room and then the well he, yeah yeah and run. he leaves too he goes down a hallway he says he was trying to find a way out and then he he's stuck somewhere and he's freaking out and then this dude comes in all buff wearing a single piece thing with a bubble over his head right doesn't talk to him but just takes him by the arm and he was like and it leads him out of the ship you know, it was just such a strange story. It was like, wow. and he was like, I get the idea that they sent this guy in there, whether that guy was really a human or he was an alien that looks a lot like us, or he was a total construct. They, after I freaked out, they sent in this thing because they knew that I would associate, I would calm down. Hmm. And he still said he started to freak out because it wouldn't, the guy wouldn't talk to him. Right. Where's the line between the construct and the, and the real yeah. Well, I think what he is meant it, by construct was it was it a fully artificial being, like you know they had just they just had a like an alien android or a human android lying around. They're like, doop, turn that thing on, send it down in there to get him. Because or he, what, or like 
contact was he perceiving it as being a, <clears throat> right it was one of the aliens right. just walked back in the room like no dude i'm swear i'm you know i'm, I'm a good looking buff dude with a blue suit on <laughs> come outside get out of my ship <laughs> so uh, on where did the road go soraya recently discussed uh, the underlying force of the phenomenon with uh, jeremy v- vaney um and pointed out that we today's society are essentially the children in the room we fail to recognize that that uh, we are not that we are not the first civilizations to contemplate the phenomenon. In fact, others who may have been not, have may not have been impeded by the social blinders we experience today may have gotten much closer to the truth than we recognize. But yet, our materialist society completely ignores their conclusions and instead looks on their collective belief systems as mythology. Yeah, yeah. I wonder that about like. The Egyptians, you know, they had this uh, this really strange idea that they can build these structures and do all this weird magic and ascend into the heavens and, uh, you know, become stars. And I don't know. There's just so much weird stuff. And then all of the the symbols and everything that they – I don't know. There's something about it that makes me wonder sometimes like, man – did they turn this into a science? Yeah. Studying this type of phenomena? Yeah. Their entire civilization started basing everything that they were doing around this type of stuff and figuring it out and learning how to utilize it. And encode it into their structures. And Yeah. Yeah. When we contemplate uh, extraterrestrial life, we tend to view it on a scale where we might place ourselves on a four or five high above wildlife, the, the wildlife around us that are, say, a one or two on that scale. And we tend to p- place potential ETs a few rungs above us um, at, at, let's say, a, a seven or eight, where they're relatable and relatively understandable to us, although we quietly acknowledge that they may be somewhat um, less relatable at the top of the scale, maybe a nine or ten. We fail to recognize the reality could be that they are so far off the chart that they are completely inconceivable to us, figuratively in the millions or billions or trillions on that scale. So far removed that they are completely invisible to us. We tend to improperly apply the Occam's razor approach to to such questions uh, related to the UFO phenomenon. If it's not from here, it must be from there. And the only there we recognize is space. However, we fail to contemplate what lies beyond our perception right here in our backyard. Yep. And I, yeah, I guess, is there any functional limit to the possibilities that life could achieve or that intelligent life could achieve technologically? I mean, can you, can you sit down and assign a limit? can say, well, they could advance so far and no farther. You can figure out the entire universe, and after that, you can't get any more advanced. Or do you keep getting more advanced now that you know all the... You may now know all the rules, but that doesn't mean you know all the tricks of using the rules, right? I mean, is there a functional limit well, where you say, all right, that's as advanced as an intelligent race can get? That's a good point. Look at the advancement we've made in the last hundred years or thousand years. Now, yeah. imagine, you know, assuming that that's exponential can imagine millions of years of yeah know, my Earth. sci-fi brain puts us you know way low on the advancement scale even though we've been you know we've been going up i'm like well i can imagine a lot more advanced than this so does that mean right. that's possible i don't know but but i think what the but, point i'm trying to express is that we can imagine this superpower right this 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 being that's has technology that effectively magic to us yeah and what i'm saying is that even that may not be anywhere near what reality is yeah this could be so far removed from us that we're incapable of even contemplating what it would look like yeah or how it would and what i guess the question i'm asking is is that the nature of that particular life itself or is it the nature of their tech you see what i mean i think those are different things like it could be that what we're exp- what we're dealing with here is just a kind of life that the universe that inhabits the universe 
that we can barely interact with or that is always at the peripheral of our ability to understand, not because they're massively more advanced than we are, but that's just because that's where they are mm -hmm. in terms of where they are in the universe. You know, they exist outside of our perceptions, not because they're advanced technologically. Maybe they are. Maybe they are also that. Yeah. But it's possible that the nature of their particular kind of life just puts them at the periphery of our ability to see. That was kind of where I was going to go too. With the, there, there's a lot of room in physics for things that don't interact yeah. with anything that we recognize. Yeah. Right. So if just just take the idea of dark matter because that's kind of the the popular idea of something that just is very weakly interacting. Right. With it doesn't interact with light at all. It doesn't all. interact with the electromagnetic spectrum. Yeah. It do, It seems to interact... Gravitically, with, yeah. but that's it. Right. Yeah. Well, why does that... Why is that the limit? And it, it isn't. There could be a whole set of things that don't interact with any of the forces, but maybe interact with our universe in other subtle ways. So you could build an entire universe inside our universe out of completely different stuff that we can't even measure. And so you do, you could have, there's plenty of space for it, right? We're not interacting with each other. We can occupy, I mean. Yeah, techni <laughs> technically there could be a dark matter earth existing right inside of ours that, because the particles of dark matter don't interact with regular particles. Yeah, except the except for gravity, right? Right. There's so a, maybe the reason Earth have it, has its gravity because there's another one there too. Yeah. Like it's like it's just, just doubled it. Or you know? even beyond know. that, like that 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 there's a whole in, entire group of of uh, laws whole, of physics yeah, and and whole and, sets of spectra. Yeah, things that that build things like atoms and molecules and beings and life that is completely it, it's it, it's existing just behind the veil. In other words, it's it just very weakly interacts. And maybe there are certain types of, uh, you know, um, symmetries between the two universes where there are doorways. Yeah. And maybe some of these phenomena are inadvertent sort of symmetries that, that cause certain things to appear or interact in some way where you have like, you know, people seeing a group of people seeing something or go, go back to the sacred sites idea, you know, sacred sites could be areas Nexus that for points. whatever reason. Yeah. There's, it's like a nodal point where yeah. somehow something is aligned in such a way that strange things happen there. And it may not even be known by either party what's going on. Like you could imagine the other party may look intelligent to us, but they might be going, what the hell was that? <laughs> <That's right>. well, <laughs> it, it, I mean, a way to look at that, it'd be like you looking at an ant and trying, you, you know, your intelligence does not g gain you the ability to understand the ant. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's in other right. words, just because you're a lot smarter. Right. In other words, that might be the stumbling block. You're on such drastically different intellectual levels that you're incapable of understanding the logic or reasoning yeah. of the ant, <laughs> you yeah. know? And, and the other thing is if this is, this scenario is actually this way that there, there are, there are other realities around us that we don't even perceive. It's also safe to assume that there could be different stages of that. In other words, maybe there are certain, civilizations that are a thousand years ahead of us. There could be some that are billions of years ahead of us. There could be you know, there's everything in between. And again, mm -hmm. so maybe, maybe this phenomenon that's so radically changing and makes no sense because some things seem physical and some things don't. And maybe they're just different stages of development of these other types of beings. Yeah. I agree with that, and I also think that, to me, it's <clears throat> the two important differences are the possibility of life itself plus the tech, right? And, I, and I, I can imagine both of those being getting to a point to where you can't tell if it's physical or not, 
right? In other words, there's the whole idea that like any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. So there you go, right? It, mm-hmm. it, it's like it, it shows up, it changes shape, changes color, and vanishes, right? And you're like, okay, that's that had to be something non-physical. Well, no, I guess I can imagine tech that could do that, but I can also imagine just just states of 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 life, you know, or, or uh, uh, of existence that the universe can generate beings that that's just how they are you know that they're that they're very their very existence is malleable in some way that we can't even understand yet maybe our tech will eventually advance to the point where we're like oh okay here's a whole here's a whole way that something can interact with itself where it can where it it, it almost looks like it's not physical mm. you know right. like it it's like sort of like de- discovering the plasma state of matter right, right. it has to become we, detectable we, first yeah we knew about we knew about solids and liquids and gases for a long time and then you discover plasma and it acts in a completely weird way Mm-hmm. You know, and it's like this is strange. All the, all the electron or all the all the atoms have their electrons free free flowing in a gas around them, and and you know, like we have to describe it in these in this weird way. But you can't experience it because you can't go like I can with water or solids or lick or, or or air. I can't go walking around in plasma to see what it's like. You know, it's a it's too dangerous. But there is this fourth state of matter. So can there be a fifth state or a sixth state? Where it's even stranger, mm. you know. And then when you think about, well, yeah, we have theoretically describing things like black holes and neutron stars, white dwarves that have even that, where they call it degenerate matter, where stuff is even weirder, where chemistry starts to happen on a gravitic level rather than electromagnetically, and with the strong where the gravity is so strong that it's the thing that drives the chemistry. So yes, like we already theoretically talk about states of material that are practically incomprehensible and something you could never bring you can't bring a piece of neutronium into the lab it would destroy the planet right mm-hmm. if you had a cubic centimeter centimeter neutronium everything would fall into it including the earth <laughs> <laughs> and it would become a very small neutron star <laughs> uh, we're very carbon centric too we tend to think that everything all life must be carbon based and there, yeah I, like saying there could be and how high life. does the periodic table go that's the other thing, you know, like they keep figuring out, well, here are some other elements. We haven't found stable versions of them yet, but potentially it could keep going up and up and up and up and up. And there could be some really strange versions of material that are elemental to the universe that they don't occur naturally here on Earth. And they may not actually or anywhere in our system or maybe. anywhere in our solar system, but they're they may be out there. All right, we assume because, you know. We don't find it here. It's not detectable. Right. It doesn't exist. But we already know things like on Earth, platinum group metals are incredibly rare. And the only place you find them is where impacts have taken place because the material from space brings those metals here. So we already know there's materials that don't exist on Earth that do exist in space that are completely different from everything else that exists here. And when you get them out, you're like, wow, I can make a really great technology with this stuff. You know, so there's there's all kinds of possibilities of that. And I think that it's multi-layered and like, so yeah, it's 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 not too hard to imagine either technologically or just in terms of materials, physics, or how the life generated, where it started. I've read plenty of great science fiction where there's one particular race of of aliens that seem to have developed in deep space. You know, mm. and they're always the ones with the most interesting technology, you know, because they weren't stuck down on a gravity well trying mm. to build stuff, you know, and they'll show up and they're like, oh, you guys, you guys don't have faster than light travel yet. Well, here you go. <laughs> here's a, here's a little thing. It only works when you get away from the star, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dumbasses. <laughs> you can't build one of those on this gravity hole. <laughs> Well, I hope this discussion has served to broaden the perspective of some of the listeners uh, and illustrated the importance of such questions. I also hope that uh, I've adequately conveyed what, uh, what, what I see as the inherent value in thoughtful and observant speculation. Yeah, absolutely. I think so. Yeah, the, st- the, the accounts you bring are always fascinating. Uh, the perspective is good. You know, I can see your, the narrative direction. So, I mean, I think it's, there are always great conversations, man. It's the Nefas. <laughs> yeah, dude. Longhead Nefas. Yep. <laughs> no. 
just to end this on, to show that this is not a new idea. 120 years ago, in the book, The Problem of Increasing Human Energy, Nikola Tesla wrote, quote, there may be, besides crystals, other such individualized material systems of beings, perhaps of gaseous constitution, or composed of substances still more tenuous. In view of this possibility, nay, probability, we cannot apodotically deny the existence of organized beings on a planet merely because the conditions of same are unsuitable for the existence of life as we conceive it. We cannot even, with positive assurance, assert that some of them might not be present here in our world, in our very midst, for their constitution and life manifestation may be such that we are unable to perceive them. There you go. Heck yeah, man. Great quote. <laughs> Great quote. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Thank you so much. It's always a blast. Yeah. When's the next one? <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to swing back into the uh, more tangible nuts and bolts end of it, probably maybe on the next one. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and maybe we'll do a Skinwalker Ranch dive. I'll give Kyle the audio book and he can listen to it. Yeah, that's there's uh, a that's lot cool. there to discuss. There's yeah. a whole lot of stuff there. Yeah. Yeah, and I wish there was more information on what they're doing now. I know it's a totally different group. But uh, well, they do have the TV show. Um, it's a little bit. I mean, know, yeah, I'm not even gonna yeah, look at that. <laughs> yeah, it's not. Uh, it's not necessarily. Uh, I mean, they show it as being like real science, but it, it's a little bit, you know, formula, typical yeah. History Channel formula for right. You know. Yeah. <laughs> I would just say after this uh, presentation, my thoughts on the UFO phenomena in general. I don't know if this is a broadening of my perspective or not, but it just seems like the all of these these you know the the big religions of the world in air quotes uh, this is what their focus is on the same stuff like they're telling you all about this type of stuff and maybe it's history and it's like the origins of these um, stories encounters that ultimately became what we call religions today that seems to be the source they in other words built on i'm not trying to say religions are about ufos you're, you're what basically I'm, going full ancient aliens there what i'm saying <laughs> is what i'm saying is is that is that uh not not the nuts and bolts aspect of it but it's all of your your the the podcast that we've done right it's gone into the spiritual Yes, there are the flesh and blood, nuts and bolts aspects of it, uh, interdimensional. I mean, that's pretty much every religion in the world is talking about all of those things. Yeah. And people whose stories are still being carried on today who had encounters. And yeah, I know it's, it's, it's ancient aliens, but that's, that is a narrow view, right? Yeah. It's all nuts and bolts. Right. It, that, it could be ancient aliens, but the aliens are a lot more complicated than they're not just nuts and guys flying here and nuts and bolts yeah, crap not, thousands of years ago. It's it's some. I'm talking about the way Marty has presented it. Yeah, right? yeah. Not, yeah, not the not. The, I'm not saying he's going ancient aliens. I'm saying you were going full ancient aliens. All right. Okay, okay. <laughs> I'm just saying he is see, pointing out that this phenomenon has been around a long time, though. Yeah, it's yeah. been around a long time, and it's very broad in the 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 ways that it affects people who have experienced it yeah. and all of those experiences have uh, very interesting similarities to things described in spiritual encounters in these yeah you know whether we call them spiritual encounters but i mean yeah and i'd say that the whole sacred sites thing it's like you know it makes me think that like this idea that there is this other physical state or that it's uh, it's inherent to what th what this phenomena is because the sacred sites today are like notorious for having ufo sightings and in some cases crop circles generated around them or whatever you know it's like the the same phenomena is pointed at certain geographical areas and does that show us that like you know and so you can show up there 
when no phenomena takes place and yet still have a spiritual experience, there's still something about the spot. Mm -hmm. So is that telling us, like, here's a clue as to the fact that, like, there we do, there is some interaction that we have with whatever the state or physics or whatever of this particular kind of thing is, because we can we can recognize, or at least certain people, maybe like you know, like like uh, shamans or whatever, can recognize these sites, and then they've become sacred sites. And sometimes they're like shunned, like the Skinwalker Ranch area, but they're recognized by people. And they have been for a long time. And in some cases, the cathedrals get built there. Mm -hmm. In other places, it's standing stones. But these places are also places where people have experiences with this kind of phenomena and other spiritual stuff. So is that giving us a clue to like, in this area is the kind of physical or physics or whatever it is, whatever it is that takes place on this planet that's intrinsic to the Earth itself. You know, that the Earth itself is emanating or generating this kind of energy what i don't know how to explain it because yeah, i don't know what it really is hard. yeah i don't know how to talk about it because i don't know what it is i don't know if it's an energy type or if it's a strange if it's a sort of a, a, a configuration of material that does something strange to space time i don't know what it is but whatever it is there are places on the planet that we can feel mm-hmm. well but to, just barely to go it, along with that i think there's also an Im- implied or implicit curiosity about the phenomenon. It appears to be curious about certain aspects of our lives as well, because, for example, the um, m- there have been many instances, countless instances, of UFO sightings around nuclear facilities. Yeah. And that that implies that they have a curiosity about what we, I find it. Or there's something in the nature of nuclear facilities that, that attracts them. Possibly. Or that I, does I'm, the same I, thing as the as as whatever. A sacred site. Yeah. yeah. That's, that you there's know, something weird happening yeah. there. Yeah. I, I You know, I, I'm, I've said this before and I know you know that I'm not very big on the whole, you know, they're concerned about our nuclear weapon stuff. Like, yeah, like yeah, if yeah. that was the case, if they didn't want us to have nuclear weapons, they just take them away. Right. They just tell us and show up. Hey, don't yeah. play with that. Guess what? You know. Yeah. I don't. We're just think going to make the DK rate not work. <laughs> on well, that they have <laughs> shut down nuclear warheads. Yeah. So they have the ability. They, you know, they disable whether let even if it were terrestrial tech, even if it's. You know, a nation that has this technology to shut down, whatever, they'd be using it. Yeah. In other words, if they have that capability. That's what I'm saying. It's almost like they, they show up because they're like, oh, what's that? I'm like, look at that light. You know, they, they, they recognize something and then they show up and they're like, holy crap. I think those things are designed to explode. <laughs> and then they turn them off <laughs> and they turn them back on and they're like, well, we got to get out of here. Right. <laughs> but there, it's like there's something that attracts them similar to a sacred site. So it's, it's there's. I don't know, you know, is it, is it, is it decay rates? You know, are they looking at this really complicated, like, are they closer elementally to these incredibly large atoms that are used in nuclear weapons? You know, like a uranium atom is very big, especially the enriched ones. It also seems like part of the, part of the answer to this whole question is, is tied to the question about consciousness and the physical yeah. body, yeah. right? How is it that you can go to a sacred site or a cathedral or something and have some experience that seems beyond a physical experience? Right. Uh, That's tied to the structure there. Yeah, or, in some weird way. And it's right. the same. It's like but even when, if it's when, just a forest, it's like still, it's yeah. like it happens. When I go to pick up the coffee cup, when is it my desire... And thought to pick up a coffee cup to my arm moving. Yeah. There, where, where does the, where's the dividing line there? Yeah. And, you know, I don't know. It's uh, so we can have these experiences that are physical in some ways, and then sometimes they're completely not physical. Yeah. But they seem to be connected. Yeah, and it's also interesting that like, like sometimes mountains, like an entire mountain will be associated with this kind of stuff. And, you know, there's not nothing built there. Like Shasta, Rainier are two that I can think of. I know there's one in Austria that's like this. But 
there's just thousands of stories of people encountering things, seeing lights in the sky, strange disappearances where people just vanish off the face of the earth, you know, all of this kind of stuff. And it's just, it's just a mountain, you yeah. know, and that, but, and then you look back in the legends and of course all the natives said, yes, that mountain is sacred, you know, only <laughs> specific people could even go on to it at a specific kind of time, you know, what? That's just crazy. Yeah. yeah. And it's it's like people have recognized this. And now these days it's in a park and people go hiking on it. And sometimes they disappear or they see things, you know, or they hear voices like that. That's just it. The phenomenon is so multifaceted. There there are so many aspects you can there. You'll never run out of topics to cover. Um <clears throat> You right, know. it's great for podcasters. It just goes to show that, <laughs> that even these, even the natives in these ancient these ancient cultures, they had their script hearts. Yeah. Otherwise, they wouldn't know <laughs> that you should never go to that mountain, right? <laughs> they, they, because somebody in their group was like, "Yeah, pff, yeah, pff, whatever, whatever." <laughs> I'll be, I'll wave at you guys from the top. <laughs> never seen again. <laughs> yep. <clears throat> yep. The old death of the skirt tire is one of my favorite stories. <laughs> I've read countless short stories where it's like, that's exactly what's happening. You know, and the guy, the, guy, the whole time the guy's like, this isn't happening. I don't believe in this bullshit. And then yeah, what's he, the word? The classic word, right? From the, he goes, oh, oh the, yeah. yeah. Poppycock. <laughs> yeah, poppycock. <laughs> Balderdash. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I call it the death of a skirt tire. It's, uh, there's plenty of those out there. Last, last <laughs> word of the script art. Yeah, <laughs> poppycock. <laughs> I mean, they 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 exist today, and in, in you know, the death of a script art is a classic trope in 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 scary movies. There's some guy that just is like, oh come on, and he goes yeah. in there and he dies. You know, the, the thing stabs him or whatever. So it's just <laughs> it's a favorite trope of the paranormal stuff. That's you know. The disappearances, the the hot. There have been, and this will. This is definitely a topic. I already have a lot of notes prepared for. Actually, is uh, like hostile yeah. UFO encounters, yeah. and you know, and mm -hmm. then you take the cattle mutilations and things like that. That they don't necessarily fit with the concept of uh, this uh, demonic, right? Exactly, yeah. right. It's not necessarily a guide. Right. It's not. Uh, you know, your conscience talking to you. This is something that's got its own agenda that has nothing to do necessarily with, you know. And again, yeah, I wonder if the, you know, if, if the sacrifices were to stop mutilations of cattle, like, is that what the problem is? is we don't, we don't give them enough, enough sacrifices anymore. So they come in and take all the parts they wanted. <laughs> hmm. I mean, you know, I'm just spitballing out here, but still, it's like people have been sacrificing their, livestock for as long as we've had livestock mm -hmm. to something and they would call it the gods or whatever mm -hmm. they were appeasing a good point. the yeah. gods and now these days we're like whatever you don't freaking sacrifice and, and then and then we go out there and there's like a whole bunch of cattle lying on the ground with stuff taken hmm. wow so it should be just you know set one on fire once a year and keep that from <laughs> happening i don't you know i'm just i don't know yeah it's how weird. would you even do that experiment you know very complex yeah well great show man Thanks. always yeah now I know less than I knew before we got here <laughs> yeah <laughs> even more confused than before this classic Snake Bros episode and uh you guys know all the stuff check out the website and uh thanks to everybody in the discord and of course that's where we met Marty so uh give a big shout out to the whole discord chat yep whole snake force yep I will probably upload or post a link to all the notes for this because there were so much and, you know, I stumbled through some of it. There's a lot of information. Yeah, that would be this. great. Yeah. So Dig I that giant, somebody... awesome list out of the trash, too. By <laughs> yeah, yeah. All the stuff I, yeah, redacted out of this. <laughs> Redactors. <laughs> all right. That's it, folks. See you next week. I think next week we'll be doing more with Ben. Yeah. So there we go. We love it. Always have. Always will. Good night, Adamu. Get back to work. Mm -hmm.